On today's program, Sharing Jesus in a Secular Society, Pastor Ted Wilson, Seventh-day Adventist World Church President, and a messy church in England. All that and much more coming up next on Global Mission Snapshots. Just before he went up to heaven, Jesus gave us a command. He gave us a mission. Jesus said, go, go unto all the world, telling them of his love. This is our mission. This is our global mission. Hello and welcome to Global Mission Snapshots. I'm Gary Krause. Today we'll be talking with Pastor Ted Wilson about a subject that's close to his heart, Mission to the Cities. We'll also talk with Kleber Gonçalves, Senior Pastor of a groundbreaking, rapidly growing church in the heart of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Dr. Gonçalves is also Director of the Global Mission Centre for Secular and Postmodern Studies. We'll also visit a church in London, England, using a creative children's church program called Messy Church. But first up, let's travel to South America to the country of Peru and meet Eva, a church planter who started a church in her own town, in part because she just didn't want to travel 30 minutes by bus every Sabbath. Along the coast of Peru lies the town of Huanchaco, once a small beach town with no Seventh-day Adventist community, Huanchaco is now home to a growing congregation. When Eva Sanchez moved here, she longed for a church community. Since the closest Seventh-day Adventist church was more than a 30-minute bus ride away, Eva took it upon herself to be a witness in her own town. Eva found a small, humble building to have meetings in and invited the whole community to attend. After seeing the effectiveness of the meetings, Eva realized the great need for a church within this community. Si se interesa. Amén. Muy bien. A ver qué nos dice la Biblia. En tercera de Juan, versículo 2. Amado, yo deseo que tú seas prosperado en todas las cosas. With a growing interest from the people in Huanchaco, Eva is still reaching out to those searching for the light of Jesus. Sometimes she walks great distances to visit people in their homes and develops lasting relationships with those she reaches out to. Her efforts have had great impact on her community. Dios que trabaja en los corazones de las personas. Por gratitud. I share the gospel because I'm thankful to God, because Jesus touched my heart, and I really feel the power of Jesus. I want to continue to share the gospel. Eva has finally found the church community she longed for when she moved to Wanchaco. As the numbers in this congregation continue to grow, their church building remains the same size. They are hoping to expand their building to fit the needs of the congregation. The needs for this church and many others around the world are great. Please pray for the faithful members in Huanchaco that they may continue to grow and be a light to their community. And thank you for your support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Pastor Ted Wilson, who is the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Elder Wilson, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, one of the things that you have been talking a lot about in recent years is mission to the cities. Why is this so important? Well, first of all, that's where the people are. Okay. Uh, about three, four years ago, the actual balance of where people live swung more into the city and urban area than in the rural area. So now there are more than 50 percent of the world's population, they live in the metropolitan areas. 
uh, within a few brief years, if the Lord doesn't come uh, before then, uh, probably about 70% will be living in these urban areas. So it's a place that God has called us to go. In fact, uh, when you read in Scripture about uh, Christ's own uh, mission and his own activities, you read uh, verses such as in, in, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses uh, 35 and 36, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, mm -hmm. all right? Now, yes, he went to the rural areas as well, and of course, admittedly, those cities were not huge at that time, but he went ar around to the cities and villages, teaching, preaching, healing, and then it says in the next verse, 36, when he saw the multitudes, so these were the, these large groups of people, he was moved with compassion mm. on them. They were like, you know, sheep that didn't have a shepherd. So we need to use Christ's uh, model and Christ's example of reaching the people in these big cities, uh, touching them in ways that will help them respond to the uh, precious message that Jesus loves them, that he's returning to take them home and that he has special plans for their lives and they need to be part of telling somebody else. So the cities have become a great theme for us now in mission to the cities because number one that's where the people are. Uh, we've been instructed that we ought to work in the cities and that it will require unusual methods and more finances, personnel, but that God will bless as we follow in his example just as he did to go into those cities and villages. Mm. Elder Wilson, early on you served as a, as a pastor in New York City. How did that shape your outlook? Well, I had the privilege of being a pastor a little bit out of the city on Long Island and then working in the city for about five years in special evangelistic activity. And that has uh, indelibly changed the way I look at cities and at our ministry and the, the way in which we work for people. Uh, you cannot live in a big city and see those millions of people every day and not be affected by the haunting question, how many of them really know the Lord? Mm. How, how are we going to reach those people with this precious uh, message, the Advent message that Jesus is coming, the three angels' messages to help them to understand that Christ's righteousness has been provided for them and that Christ is at the center of everything that we want to, to present. Uh, it, it has changed my way of thinking and obviously even now as I'm in this particular role, uh, I, I still have a great burden mm -hmm. for the cities. And happily, uh, God has provided so many others who are catching that enthusiasm as well. And they see that we need to go where the people are. Uh, because <clears throat> those people are ones for whom Christ died. Mm. And if we're not showing compassion to them and we're just focusing on the places that we feel comfortable with, mm. we're not doing Christ's ministry. Mm. Tell, tell me about the plans that the church is putting in place for city ministry around the world. Well, first of all, we like to call it comprehensive urban evangelism. And by that, it means something far greater than just holding a public evangelistic meeting, which is certainly the culmination of many activities and in many places still a very viable way to reach people. However, that's not the complete focus. Uh, the spirit of prophecy has indicated to us many ways in which to reach people in the cities. Uh, you, you need to use everything from uh, centers of influence uh, something which you're helping to champion, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, it could be a church, it could be a health center, it could be a reading room, it could be a place where young people gather to then uh, go out and, and meet with others. Uh, it could be all kinds of things, many of those having to do perhaps with health, mm. because comprehensive health ministry, which we are also promoting heavily now, and we're going to be talking more about it, it is a way in which to augment uh, the gospel message. It's called the right arm to the gospel message. It's not the message, but it's the right arm. And it's to help draw people into a loving relationship with Christ, meeting their needs. 
but we're to use everything from door-to-door -door visitation to use of publications to having young people work to having church members involved in community outreach community services and Adventist uh, community service in general to help people in the, in the areas uh, to use integrated media evangelism uh, and of course uh, a very strong health emphasis. Mm. All of these things put together are going to then foster contacts and a, a kind of an integrated way in which a comprehensive way in which to bring people into contact with vibrant genuine Seventh-day Adventists and the Holy Spirit can use that and then people can become part of the Advent movement because they see Jesus in those who are ministering to them following Christ's methods. So there's just all kinds of creative ways to try and uh, reach people in the cities and uh, you just need to get on your knees, pray and ask the Lord to help you develop something creative that's going to touch a neighbor or a community and when you talk about a community it could be just one apartment building right. in a big city. Exactly. Thank you so much Pastor Wilson. Viewers at home, if you are inspired and challenged to do something about urban mission, if you'd like to be involved, if you'd like to learn more, just go to www.missiontothecities.org. There you'll see about the range of activities the church is involved in and how you too can participate. One of the biggest mission challenges and opportunities facing the church is what we call postmodernism. And my guest, Pastor Kleber Gonçalves, has not only studied this phenomenon, but he is also ministering to this group of people. So Kleber, thank you so much for joining us. When you travel from Brazil to the United States, specifically to study, to research, you were interested in postmodernism. Why? Well, I noticed in my ministry, uh, back in, in Brazil, that we were not uh, being meaningful and relevant to those around us. And then I started to study these trends, what's going on uh, with people's minds. Uh, and right now we, we face this paradigm shift. And actually, even the definition, Gary, of postmodernism is something very difficult to us right now. When you look at the literature, you see uh, authors writing about uh, post Postmodernism, right? Just even, to confuse us, and even post, post, post modernism. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, the definition itself uh, is not something that uh, we should be too concerned. Right. You see, uh, we are living this paradigm shift right now, and it's very hard for you to define something when we are going through the process. It's easier just look at the past, and then you can pinpoint uh, aspects. But right now, we are going through this change. People no longer are guided by the pillars of the modern type of thinking about reason, uh, science, technology as the solution for all of our problems. Uh, there are uh, room, there is room right now for uh, to understand better emotions, intuition, and how do we go about life in this different type of, of context. And one of the main issues uh, I noticed and something that it's a real and a wonderful opportunity for, for us is the openness mm. to a spiritual and transcendental uh, experiences. So it is something that we can see all over the place. But there is another uh, issue that is important for us to understand. Postmodernism has different faces in the world. We cannot simply say that the same experience we face in South America is the same thing that's, that goes here in the US or in Europe, even though the main points and uh, aspects are the same. And, and one of the aspects is that there's a, a disrespect for what used to be authority figures or so before if the Bible said it, it must be true. 
postmodernists will question that. Of course. Uh, when you talk to a postmodern person, and something that it's really, <laughs> it's clear, everyone who goes through the academic process, they leave the university, uh, any university, saying that truth is, some, uh, it is something relative. Uh, relative to what or to whom? Your truth is different from my truth. Exactly, because you built your truth according to your feelings, mm -hmm. according to what you understand or what you, what you like. So it's hard to simply um, force an external authority like the Bible upon themselves. Right. So that's our challenge. How can we show Christ and the Bible as a authoritative uh, type of text to someone who simply do not believe in this kind of stuff. So it's like there's almost like a, a buffet of different options and people say, I'll have a little bit of the Eastern yeah. religion, I'll have a touch of Christianity, and I'll have a little bit of this yeah. and construct your own, right? One of the characteristics of this era is pluralism. You see, they are open. Uh, well, let me experience. And then they try to pick a little bit of, of everything and to see it will fit to their lives. But of course, as you say, this is an opportunity for Christian mission. Sure. During the past, I would say maybe three, four decades ago, the question people had is, is there a God? Today, that's uh, no longer the question that has been asked. People are asking, which God? Ah. Because they are willing to experience a little bit of Eastern uh, religions from any type of exper spiritual experience. So it's a, a, a door that's right open uh, to us right now. So the secret is how to uh, make a relevant and meaningful approach to them because they are looking for, for something. But I've been working with them for uh, several years and I know that they need to have this strong experience with God for a decision. Right, and so you, you are rubbing shoulders with these people in your ministry. Tell me of somebody who, who has been touched, who comes from this sort of a mindset, this sort of background, who has been touched through the ministry of Nova Cementi. Well, we have had so many uh, experiences in, and through one ministry, it's amazing, there is through our choir. Ah. So they come to church, they see the choir, and they want to participate. And we have uh, taken a decision as church. We are willing to get and to receive people who are not members in our church and singing through the choir so they can create friendship in that community. It's their family and they've been transformed to that particular experience. We have uh, several people who have accepted Christ through the music and ministry. So they actually come, they sing in the choir, they make friends. Exactly. Now, from what you were saying, it seems to me that it's a very important first step to get that sense of belonging. Oh, sure. Um, one thing that uh, we have learned, in, in order to reach uh, their hearts, we need to, to use a different approach in which they can feel, this is my family. Mm -hmm. They come from broken relationships. So we are simply open up our doors. So come as you are, let's live together. And then they understand how important it is to live this life with God, with Christ, in order to be changed and to experience a new uh, way of living. Mm. Kleber, thank you so much for sharing with us today. And viewers, if you want to find out more about mission and ministry to secular and postmodern people, just visit www.secularandpostmodernstudies.org. We've been working with Meta Church for five years now. We started off very small as a small group of mums and a few friends and over the last five years it has grown to a considerable size. Estelle is a member of the Stanborough Park Seventh-day Adventist Church in England. She plays a key role in running a special program here. This church has adopted a program known as Messy Church. Messy Church was started by the Anglican Church and then was adapted to fit the needs of this Seventh-day Adventist congregation. Messy Church is meant to reach out to the community in a fun, interactive way. Church members are encouraged to invite neighbors and friends who may not normally attend church otherwise. The programs are designed for children. They do crafts, sing songs, and find creative ways to teach the lessons from the Bible. Each child is required to bring at least one adult along, and the adults seem to have just as much fun as the kids.
the reactions that some people give, um, some people are quite overwhelmed with how many we have come. We have between 200 and 250 that attend on a regular basis now each month. And so when they sign up to come throughout the month, they think that maybe it's just a group of 20 or 30 children and parents. And when they realise that the whole church has been taken over with each room, it can be a little bit overwhelming with the noise and lots of children running around. But they get excited and the kids get so thrilled and excited to meet up with friends and to take part in the activities together. The activities are focused around Jesus. Kids and adults alike learn some of the valuable lessons from the Bible. Messy Church meets only once a month, and the people who attend often come back each month, bringing friends along with them the next time. Although it only meets once a month, dozens of church members are always busy planning and preparing for the next meeting. There are so many different ways the members can get involved. I am involved in a lot of music in the church, um, so when I got the opportunity to sing with the praise team, I was like, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. And I love working with kids and I love being part of entertainment. So that's, that's been something I've been doing for the past year and I've really enjoyed it. Here at Messy Church, there's even a special meal planned for the visitors to end the program. They spend hours preparing this meal for the crowd of visitors. The church members work with open and willing hearts. Say my favourite part of Messy Church is actually the organising. It does take time, but it's really exciting to put the menus together to try and find exciting ways that we can link the theme for the month through the food that we provide for those who come to visit. Members like Michael find themselves getting involved every time because they love and believe in this fun form of outreach. For me personally, uh, even though at the end of the day I'm quite exhausted, uh, I quite enjoy it. I look forward to the next messy church, the opportunity to socialize and to see the people I've met in the past, but not only that, uh, to see the smiles on the children, to this, see the smiles on the actual families, and who come back and say hello to you. Uh, I, I think there seems to be something positive that the church is doing via messy church. Please pray for messy church, that it may continue to impact the people who come and the church members who are involved. Please pray that people will come to know Jesus through this program. Thank you for your support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We often talk about global mission pioneers on this program. And over the years, I've had the privilege of meeting many of these special people. They're humble church members, usually young people, who work within their own cultures to plant new groups of believers in unentered areas or people groups. If you're interested in meeting some global mission pioneers and learning more about their work, we have a very special offer. It's a DVD that's 100% devoted to inspiring global mission pioneer stories. This is truly a wonderful resource. It's, a, it's an inspiring tribute to these wonderful, dedicated church members. So if you live in North America, just call our toll-free number. That's 1-800-648-5824. Or you can visit our website at any time, adventistmission.org, and ask for the Global Mission Pioneer DVD or offer number 310. Don't forget, clearly state your name and address and ask for the Pioneer DVD. So on behalf of Adventist missionaries, pastors, teachers, global mission pioneers serving around the world, thank you so much for your continuing prayers and support of mission. Well, that's it for today's program, and I'll leave you with this music video. Until next time, I'm Gary Krauss for Global Mission. God bless.
This is my 